despite all that uh, Joe just said, uh, to be invited to give the Marshall Lecture is for me really an undeserved honor, and I am very conscious of that fact. Yet I've been making a career of late of intruding into precincts where I may not have fully paid the required dues. For example, two days ago, I gave a talk at the annual meeting of the Society for Christian Ethics in Washington. The president of that organization is Stanley Hauerwas, a moral theologian who teaches at Duke. I had never met Professor Hauerwas, but I admire his work uh, greatly, so an invitation from him to give a lecture was one of those things that I just couldn't say no to. And his initial charge to me was to give a Catholic perspective on the underpinnings of U.S. foreign policy. Well, I am a Catholic, and I know how to follow orders. <laughs> but when I wrote the lecture and then read it over, it seemed plain to me that there was nothing all that Catholic about what I had written. And it occurred to me that when it comes to American statecraft, I actually belong to the church of disenchantment. I've lost the faith. Things that I once believed to be true about American power and the purposes to which it is put, I can no longer accept as true. I find myself strongly drawn to the heretics in the story. From Mark Twain to Dorothy Day to William Adelman Williams, and indeed to Stanley Hauerwas. But either because I am naive or because I am a Catholic, I persist in believing that truth does exist and that we can find it if we just try hard enough. So in my own unsystematic and disorderly way, I've been rummaging around in the past, searching for truths that can, for me at least, provide the basis of a new faith, one that, no doubt, will certainly differ radically from the one to which I once adhered. Hannah Arendt once wrote, when the facts come home to roost, let us at least try to make them welcome. And I think that's really the cornerstone of whatever new theology I'm moving toward. This lecture forms a small excursion, part of that larger project trying to locate new truths. And I hope that you'll receive it in that spirit. So let me begin. Not long before his untimely death, the historian Tony Judd observed that, quote, for many American commentators and policymakers, the message of the 20th century is that war works. I think Judd might have gone even further. Well beyond the circle of experts and insiders, many ordinary Americans, even today, at least tacitly share that view. This reading of the 20th century has had profound implications for the United States and for its policies in the 21st century. With the possible exception of Israel, the United States today is the only developed and democratic nation in which a belief in war's efficacy continues to enjoy widespread acceptance. Others, the citizens of Great Britain and France, of Germany and Japan took from the 20th century a different lesson. War devastates, it impoverishes, it, co it coarsens. Even when seemingly necessary or justified, it entails brutality, barbarism, and the killing of innocents. To choose war is to leap into the dark, entrusting the nation's fate to forces beyond human control. Americans persist in believing otherwise. That belief manifests itself in a number of ways, not least in a pronounced willingness to invest in, maintain, and employ military power. We should note, however, that the belief that war works has not made soldiering, per se, a popular vocation. Americans prefer war as a spectator sport 
rather than a participatory one. Why do Americans cling to a belief in war that other advanced nations have long since abandoned? The simple answer is that for a time, war did work, or seemed to anyway, at least for the United States, if not for others. After all, the vast conflagration we remember, not altogether appropriately, as World War II, vaulted the United States to the very summit of global power. The onset of that conflict found Americans still struggling to cope with a decade-long economic crisis. Recall that the unemployment rate in 1939 was several percentage points above the highest point it has reached during our own Great Recession. Notwithstanding the palliative effects of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, the long-term viability of democratic capitalism during the 1930s remained an open question. Other ideological claimants on the far left and the far right were advancing a strong case that they define the future. By 1945, when the conflict ended, almost all of that had changed. At home, war restored economic prosperity and set the stage for a decades-long boom. At least as important, war reinvigorated confidence in American institutions. The challenges of war management had prodded Washington to get its act together. Prodigious, prodigious feats of production in places like Cleveland, Detroit, and Pittsburgh that enabled the United States to raise vast air, sea, and land forces, which it then employed on a global scale with considerable effectiveness. The American way of war implied a remarkable knack for doing big things in a big way sweeping aside whatever obstacles might stand in the way. The bumptious wartime motto of the Army Corps of Engineers testified to this approach. The difficult we do at once. The impossible <coughs> takes a little longer. This was an empty bluster. The Manhattan Project, culminating in the development of the atomic bomb, testified to American technical prowess, but also implied broader claims of superiority. The United States was once again a country that did things, really big things, that no other country could do. Meanwhile, with the gross domestic product doubling in barely half a decade, the American way of life once again signified levels of material abundance that made its citizens the envy of the world. Thanks in considerable part to war, in other words, the United States had become, by 1945, an economic, technological, political, military, and cultural juggernaut without peer. This was the America into which I was born in 1947. I breathed in the war's vapors, which lingered long after the war itself had ended. Both of my parents had served. My father, a signalman on a destroyer escort in the Atlantic. My mother, an army nurse in the Pacific. For them and for countless others, the war shaped perceptions of past and present. It shaped as well their expect expectations for the future and their understanding of the dangers and opportunities that lay ahead. How well I remember as a very young boy watching Victory at Sea on television with that stirring score by Richard Rogers, the documentary series narrated by Leonard Graves, who as the theme music faded away, began each episode by announcing in his deep baritone, and now. Here was history. Gripping, heroic, medium, filled with high drama. Here, too, was the cornerstone of a grand narrative constructed around the momentous events of 1939, 1945, with special emphasis on those in which the United States had played a notable hand. I couldn't get enough of it. The history I absorbed then and carried into adulthood, the story that really mattered, 
divided neatly into three distinctive chapters. The tale commenced with a prelude, recounting the events of a pre-war era, a period of fecklessness and folly, even if for a youngster, the details tended to be a bit vague. The tale concluded with what Americans were calling the post-war era, unfolding in the war shadow, its course to be determined by how well the nation had absorbed the war's self-evident lessons. But constituting the heart of the story was the war itself. A slumbering America, <coughs> brutally awakened, rising up in righteous anger, smiting the evildoers, and thereby saving the world. One might say that the account I imbibe adhered closely to Winston Churchill's, albeit shorn of any British accent. <laughs> Thanks in no small part to Churchill, although not he alone, the war became, in Tony Judd's words, a moral memory palace, a source of compelling, instantly recognizable parables. Compressed into just a word or two, Munich, Pearl Harbor, Normandy, Auschwitz, Yalta, Hiroshima. Each parable expressed permanent, self-contained, and universally valid truths. Here was instruction that demanded careful attention. With millions of others, I accepted this instruction as unquestionably as I accepted the proposition that Major League Baseball should consist of two leagues with eight teams each, none of them situated in cities west of the Missouri River. <laughs> in the decades since, of course, baseball has changed dramatically, and not necessarily for the better, one might add. Meanwhile, our common misunderstanding of World War II has remained largely fixed. So too, has the historical narrative within which that conflict occupies so prominent a place. I submit that this poses a problem. For history to serve more than an ornamental function, it must speak to the present. The version of the past, formed by World War II and perpetuated since, the version persuading Americans that war works, has increasingly little to say. Yet even as the utility of that account dissipates, its grip on the American collective consciousness persists. The times, therefore, are ripe for revisionism, replacing the canonical account of the 20th century with something more germane to actually existing circumstances prevailing in the 21st century has become an imperative. And that requires rethinking the role of war in contemporary history. In any such revisionist project that goes without saying, military historians must necessarily play a prominent part. Now let me emphasize two preliminary points as strongly as I can. First, when I speak of history, I'm not referring to the ongoing scholarly conversation promoted by organizations such as the American Historical Association, a conversation that only obliquely and intermittently affects our civic life. I refer instead to history as a widely shared, deeply internalized understanding of the past, fashioned less by academics than by politicians and purveyors of popular culture, an interpretation shaped in Washington and Hollywood rather than in Cambridge or Berkeley. Second, I want to acknowledge that revisionism can be a morally hazardous undertaking. To overturn 